perspective uh, with like, uh, you know, youth, uh, students, that sort of thing. And it definitely uh, was something that um, some of our, our volunteers weren't necessarily uh, equipped to handle in some cases. So one example that comes to mind, we work with um, elementary and middle school students um, in programs in which we send our volunteers, of course, everything backed by mental health professionals, but lots of times the person to person interaction is through volunteers um, to talk to them about emotional well being topics such as self esteem, such as uh, self care that maybe some of us might not have been introduced to um, at like a super young age. So if they're able to kind of know these topics at that point, they'll grow up with it and, and be able to maybe uh, better deal with things, you know, uh, in the future. So that's, um, that's kind of uh, what we're trying to do in um, in those programs. So specifically in those one instance that, that that does come to mind, we were working with a seventh grade group. So uh, some of our seventh grade uh, girls volunteers came across a girl, they were talking about self esteem. And um, essentially, it was a cry for help. So usually these 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 discussions are are not too deep. They're somewhat surface level because again, mental health professional is not present at every single one of these things. Um, but she was sharing feelings of depression. She was sharing feelings of potentially even self harm. And at that point, we had taken the mental health first aid training uh, course. And while we were uh, contact our, contacting our mental health professionals, sharing the case with them, um, they were able to use. There's a specific acronym that you learn in mental health uh, first aid training. Uh, it's algae. So they were kind of able to apply the steps of that. And it's basically approaching, assessing for risk of suicide or harm. That's the A. The L is listening non-judgmentally. G is giving reassurance and information. And then there's the two E's that's encourage uh, appropriate professional help, which is that stuff that I was talking about earlier. And then encouraging self-help and other sort of support strategies like in the future. So by kind of having that knowledge, we were able to stall until we kind of, you know, escalate it to somebody who can deal with it. Uh, further. So that's one example personally in the work that that we're doing that it kind of helps. And then additionally, just as a young person, um, you know, uh, growing up, I feel like increasingly uh, mental health is a topic that we need to talk about more and more. Um, uh, you know, and there's so many different ways of stigmatizing it, you know, like in, in, in Islam, many people believe mental health doesn't have a place, but it does. Um, so these are things that, you know, if you're able to kind of uh, equip yourself with the proper skills, um, that, you know, MH, uh, MHFA, you know, by MHP um, can provide you with, then you'll definitely have more confidence in those, um, in those situations where somebody might be going through a mental health crisis. So um, that's kind of summing up um, what I had to bring to the table today. So. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal, for that. Um, again, Bilal is, and many of our mental health first aid certified uh, individuals are partners with us on this journey of destigmatizing mental health within our community. And we definitely value your support and appreciate the opportunity to provide the training to you and your organization. Next up, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce another valued partner who um, represents our uh, work in public health uh, policy and advocacy. Uh, we have with us today, Jihad Saleh, who is the government and public affairs manager for Islamic Relief USA. Jihad, I give the platform to you and I thank you for your partnership as always. Well, assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Gada, and to all of you, to Dr. Hassan and to the executive board, and to uh, Gada and your, your team, and also to all of you, supporters and friends of AMHP, American Muslim Health Professionals. I'm Jihad Saleh Williams. I'm the Senior Advisor for Advocacy and Government Affairs for Islamic Relief USA, the nation's largest Muslim humanitarian and advocacy organization. I know many of you are, have been supporters. I want to thank you for your support of Islamic Relief, but I want to say we're also, as Islamic Relief, so thankful for the support of AMHP. As a humanitarian and disaster response organization, first, I would be remiss if I don't, wouldn't say, let's take just a moment to uh, recognize the loss this weekend of so many and uh, our brothers and sisters in faith and in humanity in Illinois, Arkansas, Missouri, and so forth, because of the tornadoes. And I just, if any of you or have lost friends or family are recovering, we pray for you. And as Islamic Relief, as we determine with our disaster management team, how we're responding, we thank you for support. And for you, medical and health professionals who may be gearing up 
into response into those things. We thank you for your service. We pray for Allah's quick recovery and for those uh, families, individuals quickly trying to resp respond, uh, return to normal. But I want to thank Islam Rikleef as an as a advocate, as a lobbyist for humanitarian anti-poverty issues, health care issues in Washington, D.C. I cannot stress how invaluable the support of AMHP has been to Islam Rikleef, but in itself, as its own organization with its own mission and goals, an organization that you, as a supporter and as a member of AMHP, it is an organization that you deserve as a Muslim American health professional. It is the organization that has emerged in this advocacy and health policy work over this past day, decade. I've been working with AMHP for over a decade. When I used to work in Congress as a legislative assistant and ran the Congressional Muslim Staff Association, going back to Obamacare debate on Capitol Hill and working with AMHP to put on a briefing to raise the issues of how expanded health care as a national goal could benefit from engagement from the Muslim American community and how it would benefit the Muslim American community and communities that we serve, that you serve as Muslims or people, again, our brothers and sisters of inhumanity. So over this past decade, over several administrations, AMHP has consistently engaged the administration, particularly through HHS, sharing the important work and contributions that Muslim American healthcare professionals are providing in communities, particularly communities that lack access to healthcare, that lack quality of healthcare, and who don't have sustained benefit from healthcare. Thinking about the ways that the Muslim American community, through our values, our, our institutions, can help expand that benefit, increase that access as a partner with public institutions and private and nonprofit organizations like Islamic League. But it has been over this two years, these two years, starting with the pandemic, that I have to say that it has been AMHP where it's really shown its value and also its continued need for growth in the space of advocacy. It has been AMHP, the organization that you professional organization you deserve to have that has stuck up and helped establish the Muslim American Task Force and COVID, providing best practices along with other organizations like Islamic Relief, ICNA and Imana and so forth, working together in collaboration. And that does not always happen on the national level between Muslim organizations. I must first say that. But AMHP and its leadership, its board, its, its volunteers, providing that guidance and bringing us all together to engage government officials, HHS, on how we need to respond for equitable response to COVID and, and, and a vaccine distribution. And I would say that also, you know, it's an organization like ours that does grant and support community clinics. I'm exposing myself. I don't have the expertise in healthcare policy. So when Islamic Leaf wanted to respond to, on Capitol Hill, no doubt there was no better partner that we could say, first of all, who can we learn from and partner with to advocate and lobby with has been AMHP. And that's what they've been doing for these past two years, raising that voice, giving opportunities for professionals like you, medical professionals, heads of community clinics to engage their senators, their public officials on how do we expand and, and improve health equity. We believe in so much that we recognize that AMHP was doing such good work, they needed more. There is a dearth of this expertise in the Muslim community in public affairs and government engagement in DC. That where Islamic Relief, we decided we wanted to help establish that permanent presence. And we've provided AMHP with our first ever, the first ever advocacy grant that Islamic Relief is granted to a US organization. We know that many of you give us your grants to help communities in Ethiopia, Pakistan, or South Central or South Side Chicago, but we need a presence in DC to address the systemic health issues that communities face, communities that you serve, community, communities Muslim and otherwise. And so if there's anything you need to take away today, as is AMHP continues to be a trendsetter as it looks to 2022, as it wants to expand its capacity, and yes, providing the professional networking you deserve to provide the professional development to address the concerns like mental health in the Muslim American community to help promote the work of the Muslim American community in healthcare and medical care. But now forth, the advocacy, the lobbying on these critical issues of systemic healthcare access and equity. 
we call upon you to be that support. Empower the AMHP executive team and their and Gada and her team to have that permanent presence. The half sister Aruna Tor, the first again, first ever AMHP health public health advocacy fellow in DC, setting up scheduling lobby meetings with their senators and other officials, setting up briefings with HHS that you're going to see come in 2022. But this has to be made something permanent because it is needed. Because as part of, as being members of the, the community of Muhammad, we are advocates for social justice. Two, as you as healthcare professionals, you want to be there to not only provide the healthcare needed, but also to advocate for the systemic response to inequities in healthcare. So we thank AMHP for your leadership. We value your partnership, and we look forward to continuing advocacy, not just in 2020, but into the future. AMHP, the Muslim American community, health professionals, and the Muslim American community and like-minded communities represented in DC on Capitol Hill, in the executive departments, and in partnership with so many of the healthcare advocacy networks that the Muslim American community can be part of and a leadership. That's what AMHP is doing for you. Continue to empower them, to support them, to do that important life-saving work. Amen. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Jihad, for that um, wonderful presentation. And thank you again for all your support. Uh, Islamic Relief has been a, a valued partner for such a long time, and we thank are um, learning so much from this partnership. Uh, next up, I would like to um, invite Yamin Saima, who was the vaccine outreach coordinator for AMHP, to speak about her role and her experience in working as a, a vaccine outreach coordinator within this year that has been filled with much, uh, many challenges on vaccine uptake. Uh, Yamin, we are proud to have had you on our team and please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ghada. Um, and of course, thank you so much for everyone to being here and kind of giving us that support and letting us know that we have that community support. Um, I was initially onboarded as an intern at AMHP. However, with the growing need for vaccine confidence in our communities, um, AMHP was awarded a grant by Interfaith Youth Corps to conduct awareness and outreach activities for communities to encourage them to become vaccinated. Um, so through that grant, um, through our Interfaith Youth Corps program, Faith in Vaccines, um, AHP, AMHP had partnered with John Hopkins University Program in Islamic Studies to bring together 21 students and recent graduates to serve as vaccine ambassadors. These vaccine ambassadors were dedicated to addressing vaccine hesitancy and access in underrepresented communities and are working with religious and faith-based organizations. Um, as the vaccine outreach coordinator, I was spearheading all awareness activities and had created a series of informative vaccine digest and social media resources to assist communities with knowledge and awareness about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, AMHP had also launched a vaccine advocacy program where 93 individuals and representatives from organizations were provided the tools and resources to serve as vaccine advocates within their communities. These included vaccine outreach training sessions, along with vaccine outreach Google groups and WhatsApp groups that were designed to share fact-based, reliable information for organizations and individuals across the country. Um, AMHP had also partnered with the um, NAIF, so the National American Islamic uh, Imam Foundation, um, to create a vaccine khutbah guide to help imams and religious leaders encourage community members to take their personal health and community's public health seriously by becoming vaccinated. Um, AMHP had also participated um, in White House Zoom calls in partnership with the U.S. Department of Human and Health Services to eliminate any barriers Muslim Americans may be facing in regards to getting vaccinated. During the vaccine month of action, which was June 5th to July 4th, um, AMHP partnered with Made to Save and HHS to launch an um, aggressive social media campaign that emphasized the importance of getting vaccinated as Muslim Americans. This partnership also included participating in the weekly month of action calls, as well as reporting back to Made to Save on a weekly basis to highlight the various efforts of our vaccine advocates, which demonstrated the contrib contribution of Muslims and Muslim-based organization towards improving public health.
thank you, uh, Yamin, for uh, speaking to your role as the vaccine outreach coordinator. Definitely, we've done so much and you've done so much. And we, again, are very proud to have had you on our team and look forward to partnering with you on other initiatives as you move on in your career. Um, at this point, I would like to invite you all to join us on this exploration of our journey in 2020. MHP um, uh, has definitely grown, but also pivoted in a way to respond to the needs of our community within our um, within a pandemic year that has definitely been a challenge. I, uh, our programmatic areas in 2020 have focused on health policy, mental health, and vaccine outreach. Again, in a way, adjusting our programs to respond to the pandemic year. Next slide, please. As Yamin had mentioned, our vaccine outreach goal was structured on building trust and addressing vaccine equity and combating misinformation within this pandemic year. Uh, she, uh, as Yamin also alluded to, the vaccine khutbah guide that we created with uh, NAIF or the North American Imams Federation. That was helping imams and faith leaders encourage communities to get vaccinated. As uh, Yamin also mentioned, we established the Vaccine Ambassadors Program uh, with funding from IFYC, which had included the 21 ambassadors across the country in partnership with Johns Hopkins University Program on Islamic Studies. Our Vaccine Advocates Program had also uh, led to over 1,500 people getting vaccinated and the training of 100 and over 120 volunteers to become vaccine, vaccine advocates. We also created a vaccine outreach website to centralize access to fact-based and reliable information. As Jihad mentioned, we continued our work with the Muslim Task Force on COVID-19, which has grown to over 40 organization, organizational partners. Um, we, in 2021, we released three additional statements to the already seven, making a total of seven statements that we have collective, collectively um, released as a community in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But last but not least, we've conducted uh, 11 community-centered webinars on vaccine hesitancy and COVID-19, and of note, we had two webinars with none other than Dr. Fauci and over 120 Muslim community partners. These webinars and educational and outreach efforts have been essential to making sure the Muslim voice is heard within the community response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. We were also in the news quite uh, often, and these are just a few highlights of our um, efforts to that have high. These are a few articles that highlight our efforts within the COVID nineteen response and vaccine outreach efforts. Next slide, please. Again, with the the COVID pandemic had exacerbated some um, mental health issues that were already present and our mental health program goal was to expand mental health first aid training and increase awareness on destig and destigmatizing mental health illness. This is something Bilal had already alluded to in his presentation, but in expanding our mental health first aid training, we also saw a need for including suicide prevention trainings as well. And uh, MHP, uh, had uh, had done over 18 trainings for MHFA, and they we held these or this these trainings with various organizations uh, within the community, but including the United States Commission on Refugee and Immigrants, which was in response to the Afghan refugee uh, crisis or influx of our Af 
uh, Afghan refugees within uh, the US. We also had five mental health uh, training webinars that focused on um, addressing the issues that we were seeing within community. And we did these webinars in partnership with our community partners in, and government agencies, including the CDC and HHS. We also, we are now conducting mental health research that really highlights our MHFA uh, evaluation efforts and we'll be presenting in the 2022 Muslim Mental Health Conference next year. Next slide, please. Since the MHFA training was launched in 2019, we've trained over 1,300 community, community leaders, frontline workers, and parents, and imams, and teachers who are now certified to provide mental, mental health first aid. We've also conducted virtual and in-person adult and youth mental health trainings that were over 40 trainings in that sense. Many of uh, our organizations that we provided training to, again, our community partners, and the, these numbers are increasing. And the more trainings we do, the more organizations we know are going to be certified and equipped to provide mental health support to their constituencies. Next slide, please. Again, as Jihad mentioned, our health policy and advocacy uh, goals were centered on advocating for accessible, affordable, and equitable health care for all. Our efforts centered, again, on fostering collaboration, and we are really grateful for the launching of the American uh, Muslim Health Professionals and Islamic Relief Fellowship Program, where we hired the first MHP Health uh, Policy and Advocacy Fellow, Aruna Tour. We also launched the Muslim Free Clinics Council with over 110 member clinics. And we've been convening uh, our various uh, partners within the Muslim community for policy and committee meetings on a bi weekly basis. We've been advocating for health equity policies, and we actually helped draft the health equity guidelines for the Biden administration and have been feverently advocating for policy priorities, uh, such as the American Rescue Plan, the Build Back Better uh, uh, Act, and the Medicaid and Medicare expansion efforts across different states. We've also made sure that we, the Muslim voice is represented within government and within conversations on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, and met with over 10 statesmen and women across uh, the, our states. We released four policy statements and policy related articles and letters. And we present regularly at government roundtables and weekly meetings, whereas uh, the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services has mentioned our work over five times within their communications and press releases. Next slide, please. What we are most proud of is that MHP was invited by the White House to attend the signing of the Historic Infrastructure and Jobs Act in November as a result of uh, our advocacy efforts around this area. Next slide, please. We are thankful to all our benefactors, funders, and donors. And it's uh, in, in testament to our growth this year, uh, over 30% of our funding has been coming from grants and we are thankful to all those foundations and organizations, again, that have provided us with uh, grant funding to do our work. Next slide, please. As we are growing and expanding, we are uh, needing to expand our funding as well. About 70% of our funding goes to policy and advocacy program, as well as our mental health program. And our goal for this year is 100K, uh, but we have, we're almost one third into this process of raising the money for these essential programs. And we hope we can get your support today to do so. Another thing of note is that you can, you can, um, uh, there are many ways to donate, but I did want to note that last year we only had 
uh, one per one staff member. And this year we have expanded to three staff members, including myself as the executive director. And we are continuing to expand and we are hiring additional uh, staff uh, for four additional staff positions for the upcoming year, inshallah, for 2020. And, uh, and we are hoping that this will allow us to better serve our, the needs of our communities and represent the Muslim voice within the, our policy and advocacy work. We are also seeking uh, board members and committee members, uh, additional board members and committee members to uh, expand our uh, support and provide us with the guidance and insight as we move with our expansion and growth efforts. Next slide, please. So now that we've um, spoken to the issue of our expansion and our hiring and our need for more uh, board members and our, our appreciation of your support and guidance and insight, I would like to um, move this effort towards uh, Dr. Abdel Hakim Muhammad, who is going to, who is the CEO of the North American Imams Federation, who, which has been a valued partner in our uh, vac vaccine outreach efforts. And also he is the co-founder of Imams for Vaccines. Dr. Abdel Hakim, thank you for joining us today. And welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am so honored to be with you today. Uh, uh, being uh, part of this organization is truly what it means to interpret my preaching over 30 years in the masjid. As an imam for uh, more than three decades, we preach to the community about uh, our faith and, and, and spirituality, but we also at times have forgotten to preach about the reality of life in the most essential part of that reality is our health. You know, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith of Sahih, um, his uncle came to him and he said, uh, his uncle Abbas, he said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, what should I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for if Laylat Al-Qadr comes my way? I mean, this is the most important night of the year and uh, Al Abbas wants to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most important aspect of his life. So Rasul Sallallahu said, Ya Am, is Alilah al Afiyah. Ya Am, is Alilah al Afiyah. Hey, uncle, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for health. Being healthy means being able to do everything else in your life, including your spirituality, uplifting your religious perspectives, and your community serving. And to have an Islamic organization that can advocate for that, that can speak on our behalf uh, in, in, in front of the government, in front of the, the social justice uh, organizations, that speaks volumes how far our Muslim community have come over the years. Uh, over decades, we've existed in our messages with uh, an organization like we have right now with AMHP. This brings us to the forefront of the reality of being a true citizen of this country. So I applaud Dr. Hassan Shinawi and everybody um, uh, that are working tirelessly uh, to make our voices heard, to make sure that people know that Islam means better uh, life and better health, to advocate for that and, and to be a force. And I can testify over the last couple of years uh, working with AH, uh, AMHP as the executive director and CEO of uh, NAIF. They've been the best partner that I have worked with throughout the years. In fact, I don't remember where over 43 organizations came together if it wasn't for uh, Dr. Hassan Shinawi and his group. They brought us together. We were able to protect our messages, to protect our community. We were able to engage the imams in something bigger than just the member. We were able to feel alive within a world that felt scared. And we felt comfortable knowing that our professional health uh, personnel are standing with our spiritual and religious leaders hand in hand and making sure that our society is protected from COVID and everything else. I look forward for the future, but the future cannot be 
if we don't have support for organizations like these. Like I said, these organizations, uh, Imana, uh, MHP, and, and organizations that speak on our daily life and our necessity of life like health, they interpret the reality of Islam. And your contribution, your donation to organizations like these allows us to be part of the legislation that comes, allows us to be part of the fabric of the community, allows us to have others look at us as part of that fabric. We are not an isolated ummah. We are an ummah within ummah. We are a group within a masses that are our neighbors, our friends, or colleagues, our co-workers, our, our friends, our brothers and sisters. We cannot isolate ourselves. And to do the right thing, we need organizations like AMHP. We need them to, to represent us. Your donation, your dollar goes here, goes a long way. And I can say this with full confidence as an imam that your zakah can be dedicated to work like this because it helps those in need to understand the necessities of their need. And your sadaqah here does not decrease your wealth. Rasulullah says, Man naqasa, man man no wealth decreases because of your sadaqah. It's an investment, actually. Investment for your own self financially, investment for your family because Allah Ta'ala cures your ill through your sadaqah. Rasulullah says, Dawa mardakum bis sadaqat. It's investment for you when you meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because each one of us, when we see those piles of hasanas and we say, Ya Allah, where did all this come from? But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself will tell us, this is your sadaqah, this is your charity. I nurtured it and grew it for you. It's an investment that on the day of judgment when the heat is so close, to our heads, we are shaded by our sadaqah. The Rasul says, Al -mar'u tahta sadaqatihi. An individual is under the shade of his sadaqah. And it's also investment financially. Who amongst you are willing to lend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a good loan so he can reimburse you multiple times? It's not really a giveaway. It's an investment. It's better investment than stock markets that go up and down. The stocks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always increases and goes up and never decreases. It doesn't decline. It inclines all the time. So for you to come and partner with us today, to give your dollar, your 10, your 100, your 1,000, your 10,000, it speaks volumes of how mature we are as a community today, how willing and aggressive we are to be part of the fabric today, and how we are willing to have a voice that is heard and a voice that is spoken in arenas like the White House and other venues that I have personally witnessed AMHP speak and exist and do well and excel. On behalf of all of us and on behalf of NAIF, that I am proud of being the CEO. So today, today is a day we, we practice what we say. Today is a day that we practice our generosity. Your donation today can allow us to move forward to the next decade of Excel and excellence. Today, your donation will speak on how well you believe in the Quran and Sunnah because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hadith Aisha Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha in Bukhari wa Muslim, she said that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he only wished for two things in his life. He only wished for two things in his life. And one of those two things that he wished for, that he has wealth that he can give it left and right. And he wanted to give, he wanted to give. And there's nothing more precious to give than to save a life. To save a life. I've seen that here and I continue seeing it. And I have uh, known this group and Dr. Hassan on a personal level, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. Uh, I myself, inshallah, will donate today. And I hope everybody else that is with us today will find themselves donating. And not just you donate, we also want you to use that telephone of yours and contact all your friends and families and colleagues and help them also be partner and in associates of AMHP, inshallah. Their donations also will be a donation on your behalf because when you lead someone to donate, they will donate. Uh, their donation is, is rewarded to you also because you led them to donate. You gave them a door of opportunity, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I myself, inshallah, am donating $100 to open this door today. And I hope everybody else, inshallah, will be able to, to give. 
uh, based on their capacity and their ability. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have said in the Quran, can you to come to a conclusion that your donation is like a, 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 uh, like a plant that has a head of, of grain. Each one of them can go up to 700 times. So your sadaqah, your dollar, can be multiplied up to 700 times. There's no stocks that can match that. There's nothing in this world actually can match that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the keys of all treasures. Imagine if he opens those keys for you. Imagine if he opens those treasures for you. Nothing can get in your way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless everyone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Dr. Hassan and everyone else. And Dr. Ghada, I was honored to meet you in Chicago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet many, many times, inshallah, in the future. Consider me a soldier for this organization because I truly, truly am convinced and committed into helping AMHP today and tomorrow and in the future. Barakallah alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Hakim, for that. And thank you for the reminders and our, um, and again, we, seek your help in, in uh, continuing our programs and your support and spreading the word to everyone you know about this work because not only do we need your, uh, we would benefit from your financial support but also from spreading the word and volunteering. Uh, we need a lot of help and extra hands to do the, this type of work and we, uh, appreciate the support of everyone. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our AMHP president, Dr. Hassan Shanawani. Dr. Hassan. Assalamu alaikum. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. We're going to jump right into it, inshallah. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine who I've known since I was a medical student more than 30 years ago in the 90s. Uh, Jawad Shah, um, it, it, we stole him from Canada where he studied uh, at McGill University and then University of Manitoba um, before he went on to uh, get trained in advanced neurosurgery. And then, alhamdulillah, uh, joined us here in the great state of Michigan where I live myself um, in Flint where he's been in practice for, for many years. Um, but most importantly, um, as well as being a leader in the Muslim community, from college days, Muslim Student Association, Muslim Youth of North America, just a pillar of the Muslim community. He's an incredible philanthropist, investor, uh, and really has been working for health equity. Um, and, and all of that has come together recently with his organization, um, Insight. Uh, um, and so we wanted to take a few minutes to let him tell his story and the story of Insight and the great work that we're doing here to improve health equity and investment in people. Uh, Jawad, Dr. Shah, assalamu alaikum. It's good to have you today. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you can just, hear me all right. We can. You're, you're doing great. Okay. And thanks for joining us. I know that you're traveling right now and, and, no, and no, that's that you're okay. in the airport. Barakallah fi. Jawad, let's just jump right into it. Um, you know, you, 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 with, with your company Insight, you purchased Mercy Hospital. I myself trained in Chicago for a few years. It was a safety net hospital. Um, it was on the brink of closure. It's been struggling to provide access and COVID was no friend to safety net hospitals. I worked at the Detroit Medical Center here in Michigan. Um, uh, when you think about Grady Memorial, uh, so many facilities around the country, safety net hospitals, it's not an easy business to get into. And, and even Forbes made, wrote a whole article about the work that, that you're doing. You made this purchase for $1 and they even questioned that maybe that was too much. Uh, um, but, 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 but I know you and I know that you have a commitment. Tell us, you know, Tell us about the story that you, what inspired you as a Muslim to do this and, 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 and why mercy and, and just tell us a little bit about that. So uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, the uh, uh, Mercy Hospital was much like other things in life. Like when something uh, occurs in front of you, you see it happening. I think as physicians, as Muslims, it's hard to not react to that. So Mercy Hospital was in the middle of an area where I'm very familiar with because my sister lives in the area in the south side of Chicago near Hyde Park. So when uh, we saw the hospital, myself and uh, the, my team, the executive team at uh, Insight, uh, we saw, saw this as an opportunity to, uh, to, to then to take over. And we had noticed that the universities and the hospitals in the surrounding region, they did not feel that it was viable. Uh, they didn't think that it was something that was doable. But much like other things in life, we started to inquire until finally they 
they, uh, uh, you know, they, they provide us the information necessary, and we decided that we were going to go ahead and, and do this. When I say opportunity, though, I don't mean financial opportunity. Um, I look at it as an opportunity to do good, to deliver something that's important for the community. Uh, and that, of course, emanates from our teachings, our Islamic teachings. And so the, the question I think everyone had for us in Chicago was what's driving our decision making and our thinking and, and even our values and so on. And, you know, of course, one has to say that we're mission centric, we're, we're trying to do our best for humanity and so on. Um, but, but I think all of us, you know, we understand, uh, you know, from our own ethics and our, our own being that, you know, what we achieve in terms of our talents, our resources and so on, whatever we have to do, uh, it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's from the teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu So that's the essence really of what pushed us towards the, the uh, deal in Chicago. Outstanding, you know, it's it's but this is this is no small feat this is going to be a big lift and and there's a lot of health and equity on the south side of chicago where mercy is and, and the people is. that it served um and and a lot of a lot of i mean there's there's so much literature out there i as you know work in the payer space and and we partner with a lot of these these community facilities um things are going to have to be done differently um and to make sure that people get the medical services and the care that they need and in some sort of sustainable fashion. You have this track record. You've done work in Warren, Michigan here, you know, and, and I know the work that you did in Flint and everything. Tell us a little bit about some of those plans. What are you, what are you gonna do? And, and like, what's, what's, inform what's, what's in sight and what are you thinking about here? You know, the, uh, there's a verse in the Quran, it says, When you look at, you know, the, the work and, and, and even uh, the, the stuff in Chicago, uh, what's happening is that I can give you a lot of like, you know, uh, different things that I think need to get done, but it's all happening from outside to out of like the ease of it, the support that we're getting, the well-wishers from government and so on made our life extremely easy. And if I was to go through that in detail, I think everyone on this call would be not astonished, but shocked at the ease in which the transition occurred when it was very difficult, as you know, in Chicago, the whole lay of the land. Um, so on the one hand, I can give you a lot of uh, elements of, I think, what we have to do. We do our best, but I can, I, I can say really it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purchase, as you know, is for $1. I mean, that's public knowledge. Uh, and it was something which I, I wasn't happy about. I didn't really want it to be public. But it was for one dollar, and that was including the uh, the uh, all of the debt being paid off for us. So there's no debt on it. It was a dollar for the physical assets and the operating entity, and everything else that went with it. And so, you know, as we move forward, though, we started with a very clean slate. Uh, coming into it, though, operationally, there's probably three, four hundred things that I can right now quote to you. Operationally, this has to be done differently. That has to be done differently and so on, because if we want to do good work, we also have to think about solvency. And solvency, financial solvency, is not easily achieved when one is in a situation where there is a very bad pair mix. Um, we do, I believe, more uh, charitable care in Chicago proportionally than any hospital currently in the city. Uh, I'm saying even now, we took over in June. We have, I think, 58% uh, or so Medicaid uh, we have probably about 15% that don't have insurance. So we have about 25% that have Medicare or commercial insurances. So people who are aware of these numbers will, of course, understand what that means. So yet still in that environment, you know, what can we do to sustain uh, something, which I would say is kind of like the lifeblood of the community. I mean, the community needs this desperately. You know, the surrounding community is, it would become a healthcare desert without the existence of the institution. On the other hand, on the other side of the coin, I would say that we've succeeded, alhamdulillah, in reducing costs, in uh, ensuring the facilities are working properly. And for almost six months now, we've been operating very well, alhamdulillah, returning service after service. Uh, we are fully functioning in the operating room and so on. So, but, but then it requires, I believe, a degree of innovation that whatever Allah put in, put in us, when it comes to the financial side. 
And uh, I would say that much is written about Rasulullah after he was 40, and much is written about him before he was eight. But between eight and 40, what was he doing? Not as much has been written about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the more fascinating reads that I've had of, of, of late is, is German economists analyzing the Prophet and his history, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the lens of economy, not from the lens of the Sita, hmm. from the lens of economy, not from the lens of any type of uh, religious fervor or theology or proselytization. And when they analyze it that way, they don't care about that other stuff. And in it, he was starting, he looked at what Rasulullah did to make the entire community solvent, to, uh, to empower, uh, you know, the idea of, of uh, empowering the community with tools that then unleashed incredible forces. So we talk about capitalism, but the theme that people talk about now is market-based economies of supply and demand relating it back to Adam Smith and his position that, you know, that the market sets, sets its own rate, rates, it's the invisible hand. This, these economists pointing back to Adam Smith say he wasn't the first man to say it. Rasulullah you know, years prior, a thousand years prior, he said that the markets are set by the hand of God. And this was a very unique and revolutionary statement because from Mesopotamia until the time of our prophet, markets were set by government's hands, by leadership's hands, tribal leaders would set prices. When there was a famine, they came to our prophet and he said, it's not my choice to then dictate what the prices are. Supply, demand, they're set by Allah SWT. This was a revolutionary statement. And when he unleashed those market forces, a market-based economy, uh, he unleashed incredible power that had its repercussions in Europe, uh, Venice, uh, all over the world. And the uh, expansion of the Muslims uh, had a lot to do with these theorems and ideals. Ideals. Fast forward, it was the initiation of the Al-Qaf and the Waqaf that led then to stabilization of institutions and then growth of those institutions. These are genius moves that were initiated and the entity could exist outside of a human being that had rights, responsibilities and so on. So again, uh, Hassan, I don't wanna go too far but I don't, I think being innovative in the space, in this, these financial spaces is critical. You have to have the right team and so on. But again, I, I don't wanna bore you with all the things, but it's, I would tell you it's not one thing, it's multiple things. And uh, you, you would be surprised, I think, at, at the ease at which these things can be resolved if one really thinks properly about it and waits for the better couple of not data. Let's talk a little deeper about one of the things that you brought up. Actually, one of our listeners asked the same question that I was going to ask about showing mercy, not just the title of the hospital, but Rahma to the people of, of Chicago. Um, this hospital, you know how long the Prophet Sallallahu worked to earn the trust of the people that he served. He decades, right? I mean, you know, before before he was given the Risada. This hospital that you that you're taking over that you've taken over really centers on community and has deep, deep, deep connections to the people that it serves. You mentioned the response to the community already, and and but but tell us a little bit more about that and 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 what are your plans and and then also you know what role is the Chicago Muslim community or the Muslim community in general doing with some of the transformation and some of the work in this space? Um, I think that the, our responsibility. Uh, as individuals, I think, within our institution, and I would say the wider Muslim community and the, uh, the, the wider faith and non-faith community, good people from every uh, different background, faith and non-faith, um, is to you know, try and look at what we, who we are as a society. Um, our you know, the Christian and Jewish and Hindu and Buddhist ethics lead to something very similar to what we preach in Islam, which is the idea of qist, you know, like a social equity. When we talk about justice, we don't talk about adil. You know, adil is, is, is a type of legal justice, perhaps. Qist, on the other hand, is the wider, true existence of a just, socially just society. And so to achieve that, one cannot, one has to look at these things as not as a bystander. Uh, if you come uh, in Chicago, and you look at the, uh, the center of the city, the magnificent mile where you've got on Michigan Avenue, where you've got the top end stores and so on, 
average life expectancy is 90 years of age. You come two miles south to where we are, which is by the convention center on Lakeshore. It's beautiful. It's on the north end of the south side. The life expectancy is 60 years of age. So uh, that's a 30 year difference. Um, what leads to those, those situations? Um, what uh, talents do we, be, do we bring to bear such that we can understand why and help rectify it? It's not enough simply to deliver good health care and uh, in the sense of prescribing medications and seeing people and, and then ushering them out. Their health is not driven simply by that because we can control their blood pressure or do uh, exceptional surgeries. Uh, the issue is that there's disparities, there's inequities that have historic roots. So I would say that our responsibility goes beyond simply you know, doing good medicine. You know, we're, we, we should look at ourselves as an anchor, uh, as a, an anchor community, uh, not just an institution that understands at a wider and more holistic level what needs to get done. If you have young people who are in broken homes, their fathers are in jail for correct and incorrect reasons. Um, there's infrastructure uh, that uh, you know, prevents them from growing. And then you know, you're able to treat a pneumonia. What you, that entire world you've not addressed. And as physicians and health professionals, our voices are needed and they're heard even in, in, in areas that are outside of medicine. So rectifying, if we are uh, you know, true to the idea of delivering health, then we have to address those issues. And I think that looking at the Chicago uh, the situation in Bronzeville and surrounding areas, uh, you know, when we look at the kids and the surveys we've done uh, for, for the children since we came, we're seeing great inequities in internet speed, access to computers, teachers, tutors, uh, unable to uh, go to the best schools, not having supervision, parents who themselves have deficiencies now tutoring their children. We know what's gonna happen. Fast forward when they're 20, 25, 30, uh, you know, for us to not address these things, I don't think uh, really behooves us uh, as people who espouse the idea of that true social justice or at not as Muslims and not people, uh, good people of any faith or any background. We, that really comes in, into a segue really nicely into, into our last question. We're almost out of time. You know, thinking now, I want you to talk to the people of AMHB, you know, that American Muslim Health Professionals serve. You know, we have our Council of Muslim Free Clinics. It's got over a, a hundred, it's, I think it's 110 now member organization, it's growing to talk about health equity. There's such a commitment within the American Muslim community. You know it, you led it for years. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's been part of your raison d'etre as a physician, as long as I've known you. Last question, what's your advice? Like, what would you share with them? Just you've been on this journey as long as I've known you since at least the nineties, what would you say to them? You've got that minute to do it. Um, I think that there's challenges. There's tremendous challenges that are out there and our full ethics and talents uh, have to be utilized to resolve them. Uh, and mental health is not a small issue. We have deep problems that are occurring among the veterans, homeless and the psychiatric and psychological issues that are reaching levels of pathology, the science that needs to go into trying addressing them and the innovative ways to address them. We have interesting theorems emanating from our own dean through the Quran in terms of how do we address these issues. We talked prior to this, Dr. Khan and I, about the idea that, the, that our prophet tr treated uh, the idea of depression as a thing that we ask refuge from. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al wal hazan. You know, the idea that there's this mental health state that we're asked to ask Allah to protect us from, right? There's, there's so much deep teaching, not only in defining the problems, but resolving them if we are willing to, to delve within our deen. This needs to be delivered to the communities around us. That's in areas of pathology, but areas that are outside of pathological states, how much depression do we have that's subclinical? How much people, uh, how, how much do we see people hurting in their communities and so on? This uh, idea of mental health goes far beyond simply the idea of pathological states and psychiatric problems that re require hospitalization. It needs deep, deep thinking and the revisions that are needed across 
it's one area of medical science that needs tremendous understanding. We don't understand our theorems are based on very, uh, I would say, incorrect ba bases, even the brain-mind problem, what the brain is and what the mind is, my own area of specialty, cognition and so on. We're, our theorems are, 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 are suspect, I think. So it's, it's up to us to really address that. Beyond that, the, just the idea, the theme of serving the surrounding community, that should drive everything that we do, even more so than our own Muslim community. We should be, uh, which we, we should be uh, driven by the needs uh, of, our, uh, of the community around us, our neighbors, our friends, our people who are there. That will then build our own ethic. But, but our driving force is not simply an internal look at what I, we as Muslims need for our own community. We should be driven by the needs of people around us. Jawad Barakalafiq, this is going to be an amazing journey. I hope that inshallah you'll come back and tell us more about the incredible work that you and Insight are doing. And, and we want to hear more. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. But in the meantime, Jazakallah khair. I know that you had a busy day. Exactly. Safe travels okay. today. Uh, exactly. uh, make da'a for us. God bless you and the work that you're doing and, and the people that you're serving and, and the people at Mercy who serve those, those, those people. Jazakallah khair again. Salaam wa rahmatullah. And, and let me take a minute to thank all of you for joining us today um, here at AMHP. Uh, this is uh, this this month will be my um, will be uh, two years for me. It was it was in January of 2020 when I was invited to be the president of AMHP, um, and only six weeks later when we had to make the devastating decisions to work across the country. You heard about them to ask people to close masajids um, to to keep to protect ourselves and and. And it was a fateful, fateful day uh, that, that you heard about earlier today. We continue to struggle with the pandemic, multiple pandemics. The COVID has exposed many issues, many needs, many health inequities, to say nothing of the mental health issues that Dr. Shah just talked about and that you heard earlier uh, during, the, during this webinar. AMHP is continuing to do incredible work serving the mental health needs of the American Muslim community, advocating with the Muslim voice in Washington, DC, and continuing to serve to meet the COVID needs uh, of the faith-based communities around the country and partner with our, 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 our faith communities uh, of other faiths and other communities. And we're continuing to do incredible work in health equity. This work takes, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of money. Please support AMHP. It's incredible work. It's tax deductible. It's Zakat eligible. You can either donate through our website or through many of the payment platforms that are available. If um, I believe we're gonna put it up now. Again, I wanna thank you for giving us an hour of your valuable time today. Um, uh, don't just contribute, ask your friends and, and, and family and, and, and people to contribute. We're, we're absolutely committed to this message. And I hope that you'll join us again uh, during 2022. And uh, let me be the first to wish you uh, a happy new year. And bi'iznillah, we'll see you guys. Uh, and you'll be hearing from us again, inshallah, during Ramadan, which is only around the corner, through a few months away. We have many needs. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.